Hello friends and today's lecture we're going to talk about uh, malignant hyperparexia. Uh, malignant hyperparexia is a uncommon pharmacogenetic and potentially fatal clinical syndrome uh, that is related to the abnormal skeletal muscle and uh, this manifests as a hypermetabolic uh, syndrome in a susceptible individual who is exposed to volatile anesthetics and uh, depolarizing muscle relaxant succinamethania. So how uncommon is this? So the incidence of malignant hyperexia is actually variable. It depends on use of anesthetics uh, triggering agents and the prevalence of malignant susceptibility in the population. In some places, it can be as high as 1 in 200. Uh, but then this incidence is probably related to uh, the use of succinamethonium, uh, common uh, volatile anesthetic agents. In the pro uh, French population, it is said that it is almost 1 in 2,000. In Denmark, uh, fulminant malignant hyperparexia is 1 in 200,000. Uh, to almost 1 in uh, 5,000. That is if all the susceptible uh, malignant hyperexia uh, cases are taken into account. In the general population, it is believed that uh, MH exists in uh, 1 in 15,000 in children and 1 in 50,000 in adults. It is a lot more common in males and affects all age groups. The penetrance of the causative gene uh, that causes uh, malignant hyperexia is variable. So patients actually can have multiple uneventful anesthesia uh, before they manifest MH in one of their anesthetics. So what is the pathophysiology of MH? So exposure of the cells in the skeletal muscle uh, through triggering agents that is succinamethonium and volatile anesthetic leads to abnormal release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the site of abnormality is the ranadine receptor now to go into more into pathophysiology of the MH we need to understand the normal the uh, you know sequence of events that occur in contraction of a skeletal muscle so once the discharge of motor neuron occurs there is release of acetylcholine at the motor end plate the acetylcholine reaches the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and this increases sodium and potassium conductance in the end plate that leads to the generation of the end potential, end blade potential, and the action potential. This action potential spreads uh, along the T tubules, and this is the important part. And the T tubules, there is this uh, voltage sensors in the dihydroxypyridine receptors (DHP), which are linked with the ranadine receptors. And ranadin receptors link the sarcoplasma or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the action potential reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it uh, releases calcium. This calcium then diffuses into the uh, cytoplasm and it uh, reaches the uh, troponin C, attaches to troponin C and uh, uncovers uh, the myosin binding site on actin and formation of cross-linkage between actin and myosin occur and that's how the contraction occurs. This all, uh, the calcium also causes re uh, the uh, release of energy from mitochondria where the oxygen is uh, consumed and carbon dioxide is released. It is also involved in uh, the uh, glycogenolysis, glycogenolysis that leads to the formation of lactate. So you can see where the carbon dioxide is produced, lactates are produced. These are normal uh, things. And 
Later on, the calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this requires uh, energy, of course. And uh, the calcium from troponin uh, C is released. And the uh, interaction between actin and myosin ceases and the muscle relaxes. So, how much uh, we need to know about the ranadin receptors. And like I have already explained, and this is the calcium release channel. And it spans the cytoplasmic gap between the sarcolemma uh, of the T-tubules and the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it is also links to the voltage-gated gate channel, that is the dihydroxypyridine channel. And this is uh, showing the full diagram of this uh, uh, receptor. What is not shown here is the uh, DHP uh, receptor, which is all linked to the Ryanin receptor. <coughs> so, ox exposure of patients, uh, uh, you know, susceptible patients to uh, anesthetic triggering agent, and there are only two of them. And this is just the volt anesthetics and the depolarizing muscle relaxants, sexamethonium. That leads to alteration in the receptor protein structure of, that is the Ryanin receptor. And this leads to the prolonged opening of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium channels. And this happens at an abnormally high rate. Uh, this is basically flooding of the whole tissue with calcium intracellularly. And this, uh, Huge release of calcium causes both direct and indirect uh, stimulatory effects on the metabolism. Uh, directly, it increases glycolysis via phosphorylase activation. And indirectly, it increases demands for ATP, uh, which is required for contraction and relaxation of the muscle. So, because of this hyperstimulation of aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, there's, there is increased production of carbon dioxide, uh, increased production of lactic acid and hydrogen ions. So, there is hypercarbia as well as metabolic acidosis. So, as already explained, uh, the uh, in MH, there is excess generation of carbon dioxide. There is uh, increased utilization of oxygen, so there is depletion, so anaerobic uh, metabolism will set in. There is muscle rigidity, massive heat production. And if this continues, then it can lead to cell death and rhabdomyolysis. This will lead to severe metabolic acidosis. The muscle will release lots of uh, potassium and myoglobin. The myoglobin uh, is filtered through the kidney uh, where it can precipitate and obstruct urine formation and can lead to acute renal failure. So what is the genetic basis of MH? First of all, it is an autosomal dominant inheritance. And the genes that code for the Ryanodin receptor is present on chromosome 19, the long arm, and on the uh, chromosome 7 for DHP receptors. So, as I have said that any, uh, you know, defect in the Ryanodin receptor or the DHP receptors, uh, which are both linked, DHP receptor is the voltage-gated channel through which the action potential uh, comes in and uh, it is transmitted to the Ryanodin receptor that leads to release of uh, calcium into the uh, cytoplasm. And there are more than 40 distinct mutations which are known. The one which you need to remember is for the genes that code for Ryanodin receptor on, which is on chromosome 7, 19 and for dihydroxypyridine, uh, which is on chromosome 7. De novo mutations uh, can also occur, so there is no 
not necessary that there is a family history. Uh, the genes uh, mutation which are associated with the MHS are assigned a numbering uh, sequence identifier. So we have MHS 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have MHS1, uh, this is the most common one, uh, seen in 50 to 70 percent of the patients. Uh, the gene uh, for this uh, randomly receptor 1 uh, is present on uh, chromosome 19 uh, on the long arm, uh, that's the Q, and in the region of 13.1. So this is the heart spot, this is called the heart spot. Uh, you can see that in the uh, image on the right side uh, where you can see the short arm P and long arm Q of the gene of the sorry of the chromosome. The MHS2 is uh, linked to chromosome uh, 17 and uh, the locus is on the uh, long arm Q 11.2 and uh, Q24 and this is associated with voltage dependent sodium channels of the skeletal muscle and uh, you've seen that the calcium need to be moved out of the uh, you know the cell uh, using the calcium and uh, sodium channels so when sodium channels are defective then the calcium uh, uh, cannot move out of the cells easily so it is uh, actually stays there and causes the uh, you know all the uh, effects of uh, malignant hyperaxia MHS3 is uh, on chromosome 7 in the re region Q21 and Q22. And uh, this is the other important site which is uh, codes for DHP, uh, which is the voltage sensors on the T-tubules. So these are important one as well. The MHS4 is linked to uh, chromosome 3. Uh, uh, the site is Q13. MHS5 is associated with chromosome 1, uh, side is Q32, and MHS6 is linked to the short arm uh, 5P. Okay, this is the only one which is actually linked to the, to the short arm, most of them to the long arm Q. I have said that there is variability in uh, phenotype expression in MH. So uh, some susceptible individuals do not manifest MH signs uh, every time they're exposed to anesthetic uh, agents. So they can actually have, you know, normal anesthetics and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, later on in one of the anesthetics, they will uh, suddenly uh, uh, show signs of uh, MH. And some individuals known to be susceptible to MH based on genetic screening, they do not demonstrate an in vitro positive response to the caffeine uh, halothane contracture test. Okay, so there is genetic basis to it, but when they are exposed to caffeine and halothane, their muscle uh, samples are uh, tested. They don't react to the halothane or caffeine. So this variability in phenotype expression is known. So the onset of uh, acute MH uh, can present with one or more signs of uncontrolled hypermetabolism. Uh, and obviously this is associated with general anesthesia only uh, where triggering agents are used. And the most common signs are tachycardia, hypertension, muscle rigidity, increased production of CO2, which can be seen as in rise in the internal CO2. And clinical present presentation is also not uniform and the, uh, the time of onset can also be variable. So you can actually have, uh, you know, the patient not presenting uh, during the whole anesthetic. The presentation might be later on in the uh, post-operative period. Okay. And they may not present as severely as, uh, you know, some patients may. So there is variation in the presentation as well. In uh, children, uh, succinamethonium is commonly known to cause mesotric spasm. But not all these patients who have mesotric spasm will end up to have uh, MH. <laughs> the hyperkalemia can lead to premature ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. Uh, there is uh, can be localized or generalized muscle rigidity. And this is despite using enough amount of uh, muscle relaxants. 
And if you're using the uh, you know CO2 absorber, uh, you will see that it's getting exhausted. It become really hot. Okay, that is also one of the early signs. So if you look at this image, there are signs of uh, you know hypermetabolism. There is tachycardia. There is uh, increase in antiviral CO2. The temperature has gone up. So hypercarbia, tachycardia. And if the patient is uh, spontaneously breathing, then increase in minute ventilation, increase in muscle rigidity despite presence of uh, muscle relaxants, uh, skin mottling. Okay, then temperature. Temperature is actually a late sign. And then if the patient is catheterized, you might actually see a cola colored or tea colored urine. And during the surgery, the, the, uh, patient, the surgeons might actually uh, say that this patient is not is is bleeding a lot so they can actually go into DIC and that's it looking at the cola color or tea colored urine in uh, myoglobinuria or rhabdomyolysis and the signs and uh, laboratory finding include that uh, you're monitoring antidotal CO2 there is increase in the antidotal CO2 if you're taking a blood sample uh, a blood gas, they see P or increase in PaCO2, and there is a mixed meta uh, metabolic and respiratory acidosis. The Pa2 is uh, reduced. There is uh, hyperkalemia, and uh, the CK rise is uh, uh, not always seen acutely. It happens later on, and I'll explain in that in details. And uh, you can see myoglobin in blood and urine. Uh, the coagulation test may be deranged, and you will see increase in lactate levels and like I said rise in temperature is a late sign so hypothermia occurs because of continuous uh, muscle contractures that generate uh, heat uh, which cannot be dissipated to the environment so the temperature rises and this rise can be almost one to two degrees every five minutes you can actually see severe hypothermia in these cases. The temperature can go as high as 44 degrees. This increase in temperature leads to increased oxygen consumption, increased carbon dioxide production, and it can lead to widespread vital organ dysfunction and even a DIC. If this is uncontrolled, and then it can lead to cellular hypoxia, cell death, and worsening of the progress, uh, progressive worsening of the metabolic acidosis. So you get a mixed respiratory as well as, uh, uh, you know, metabolic acidosis. The death of the uh, muscle cells can lead to rhabdomyolysis, like I've explained, and this releases lots of potassium and myoglobin uh, into the blood, and this can lead to acute renal failure and uh, also uh, cardiac, severe cardiac arrhythmias. The other life-threatening complications that have been associated with MH or uh, DIC, a uh, patient can go into congestive cardiac failure, they can have bowel ischemia, and the death of the muscle can lead to compartment syndrome of the limbs. There is an entity known as the aborted or subclinical MH. So in these cases, the patient can present with non-specific signs of hypermetabolism after they have been exposed to volt anesthetic with or without uh, succinamethonium. Uh, but these signs actually you know, on discontinuation of the anesthesia, they disappear. Okay. But that does not mean that you can actually, uh, you know, take it uh, lightly. Uh, you need to make sure that there are clear instructions to the patient. And the red flags in these cases are usually if the patient complains of post-operative muscle pain or there is myoglobinuria or there is elevation of potassium or uh, creatinine kinase in the post-operative period. That would suggest that this patient did actually have MH. So these patients should be observed in the hospital for signs and symptoms of MH. They should have serial CK and potassium levels done. 
and uh, ABC should be done if there is increase in minute ventilation which is out of proportion to the clinical situation. The patient exactly has got good pain relief, all right. The patient is, looks comfortable and still he is hyperventilating in the post-op. Then you actually get, uh, you know, uh, alert and, um, you know, uh, you send for the ABG. And what you look for ABG is mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis. And I will stress this again and again that you have to look for mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis. So the rise in myoglobin is, is acute in this uh, case, but the CK rise occurs around 14 hours after the uh, presentation of MH and it will keep rising and it can go as high as 20,000 international units. And it will remain in a person and then only it'll start going down after around 72 hours, you will actually start uh, seeing decline. But if patient obviously develops renal failure and goes into intensive care, this might take a longer time to, uh, you know, come back to normal. We will discuss a bit more about uh, mesenteric spasm, which is, is very common. This is almost in 1% of the children will present with uh, mesenteric muscle rigidity. And in 13% of cases, this is harbinger of MH. So 30% of patients uh, uh, will only 30% of patients who actually uh, show mesenteric spasm uh, will go on to develop uh, MH. But uh, when patients are actually referred for muscle biopsy, almost 50% actually show uh, positive signs to caffeine and halothane exposure. That is, they become positive to caffeine halothane contracture test, indicating they are MH susceptible. So if you look at the uh, signs of jaw stiffness and look at the population on the y-axis, there are quite a few patients who will actually show abnormal jaw stiffness uh, when exposed to succemethodium. Uh, some of them will actually uh, be so severe that it will interfere with intubation. But it is only when it leads to almost a jaw of steel, you are unable to open and that you become really suspicious. And these are the patients who probably uh, will, uh, you know, go on to uh, be positive for the contracture test uh, or develop MH. So what do you do in these cases uh, who develop uh, signs of, uh, you know, uh, the mesotric spasm? Uh, so first of all, you discontinue the triggering agent and only the urgent surgery are performed and this are performed under the total intravenous anesthesia. You carefully observe for early signs and symptoms of hypermetabolism and uh, you uh, probably uh, you evaluate them. Uh, you need to look at uh, the bloods, uh, look for potassium levels that they are, uh, they're not rising. Uh, CK, like I said, are usually uh, slow to, uh, you know, rise. So they only will be seen to be positive in later on. Uh, but what you can also look for is that uh, the urine, hope it's not becoming brownish uh, in color. And on ABG, uh, we look for uh, mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis. The CK should be done serially, and um, this can go as high as 20,000 uh, units per liter. And this is predictive of MHS in more than 80% of the cases. And like I said, it peaks around 14 to 24 hours after the crisis. So how does MH under anesthesia present? So first of all, we look at the entitled CO2. There is a significant rise in the entitled CO2. It can go two to three times the normal. And this happened despite the normal uh, minute ventilation. And this rise does not respond to way, uh, when you increase your minute ventilation. Uh, the rise can be gradual or it can be a severe um, uh, sudden. And it is severe, it is almost uh, the internal CO2 can go up to more than 100, 100 millimeters of mercury. And it's important that uh, when this is happening, uh, that you rule out uh, there is no malfunction uh, within the anesthesia machine, 
the valves are not uh, malfunctioning especially in the uh, you know circle system uh, there is uh, the expert port is not uh, you know stuck and uh, you obviously look at uh, you know ventilation parameters the ventilator is working fine uh, the minute ventilation is uh, okay uh, the flows are okay there's no rebreathing within the system like for in this example this is uh, the uh, internal co2 is 8.8 .8, which is almost 66 millimeters of mercury this is actually on the rise okay but like I said, this can go up to as much as 100 millimeters of mercury. And you don't actually have to take an arterial blood gas. You can actually just take a venous blood gas while you are taking blood for, and then just take uh, some of the venous blood and put it into a blood gas machine. And here you will actually see mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis. In the early stages, the metabolic acidosis may not be uh, severe. Uh, but presence of hyperkalemia is corroborative and uh, like I have said uh, the creatinine kinase may not be elevated initially it takes almost 14 to 24 hours to go up. Myoglobinuria uh, happens because of the uh, muscle cell you know uh, membrane lysis uh, the muscles are dying and this causes discoloration of the urine the urine can be cola or tea colored and this can be observed under a urinary microscope or you can actually just do a, a dip stick in a test for the urine and look for heme and uh, I have already uh, mentioned that the myoglobin does actually rise early uh, but the CK elevation occurs after about 14 hours okay and it can peak to very high levels of almost 20,000 units per liter in the first 24 hours. This is a clinical grading and for MH and uh, we give points for each presentation. So the process one is about muscle, is for about muscle rigidity. You give 15 points for generalized rigidity, uh, 15 for uh, mesotric rigidity. The second uh, process is about myonecrosis uh, where you see rise in the CK more than 20,000 uh, with or without succinethonium, each of them will get 15 points. Uh, color colored urine uh, indicates myoglobinuria, uh, we get 10 points. And if you're measuring myoglobin urine, if it is more than 60 milligram per liter, they get 5 points. And if this potassium is uh, more than 6 milligram per liter, then they get 3 points. The next process involved is respiratory acidosis, where either the antidotal CO2 or PO-CO2 is raised. Uh, so it's if it is more than uh, 55 we control ventilation uh, that is entitled then if 15 points uh, if the arterial co2 shows that it is more than 60 with control ventilation then it's 15 points entitled co2 with more than 60 in with spontaneous ventilation 15 points or leave alone the values if there is inappropriate hypercarbia or inappropriate uh, tachypnea they will give 15 and 10 points uh, for each of them the fourth process we look at is this temperature if there is a rapid increase in temperature uh, 15 points or if there's inappropriate temperature rise more than 38.8 degrees celsius in the peripoperative period then they get 10 points and the process phi is about cardiac involvement and uh, this is usually related to hyperkalemia if there is inappropriate tachycardia which can be early sign of course uh, it's three points but if the patient develop ventricular tachycardia or vf that too is, is given at three points so this is called LERAC uh, clinical grading uh, scale and we take a raw scoring system and then rank it and uh, then look at the likelihood of a match so MH is considered to be likely uh, when the scores are uh, 35 to 49 and uh, that is uh, rank 5 and they are almost certain if the points are more than 50 percent and that is the uh, the ranking is 6 okay uh, below uh, 35 uh, they say there is uh, you know from 20 to 34 or uh, rank 4 there is somewhat uh, likelihood of MH 
Uh, below that, uh, you can actually uh, just uh, consider that they are very unlikely to happen. There are multiple uh, differential diagnoses for HMH. Uh, these are of, often uh, conditions that leads to tachycardia, acidosis, and hypercarbia. But what is important in that rule out is that when you actually take a blood gas for these conditions, uh, that these are not associated with mixed uh, respiratory and uh, metabolic acidosis. So in AMBH, it's important to actually see that there is mixed uh, respiratory and metabolic acidosis. CO2 is raised, lactates are raised, and the uh, there's uh, you know negative uh, uh, in the uh, base deficit is huge. Uh, so these these uh, components uh, are important in MH that there is a mixed. Uh, respiratory metabolic acidosis and I keep stressing on this point. Hyperthermia, uh, unfortunately, like I said, uh, this does happen. The temperature can go extremely high, uh, but uh, this is a late sign. And sometimes it can actually happen in the post-operative period. So uh, the patients who show signs of hypermetabolism, they need to be observed uh, for nearly four hours. But also you need to rule out other causes of uh, hyperthermia or raised temperature in the post-operative period. Of its most important is transient uh, bacteremia and patients uh, who have had, say for example, abdominal sepsis and had a laparotomy for that. Now also in sepsis, okay, which may also present with elevation in CK and uh, uh, show uh, metabolic acidosis. Coming to the uh, rhabdomyolysis, and, uh, and these can present uh, in the acute MH or uh, MH uh, susceptibles, uh, patients who have underlying uh, myopathy. Uh, they can also present in patients who are not susceptible to malignant hyperexia, uh, but in patients who have uh, malignant hyperexia, and the succinomethonium uh, leads to almost 100-fold increase in myoglobin. And uh, with uh, repeated exposures, they can be further rise in myoglobin levels. You also have to look at other causes of rhabdomyolysis in patients, uh, especially patients who had uh, prolonged surgery or uh, the tunicate uh, time has been more than, uh, you know, uh, two hours in the lower limb uh, can also uh, lead to myoglobinuria. Uh, and also certain uh, muscle disorders can predispose to, uh, you know, rhabdomyolysis. So how do we treat uh, malignant hyperexia? And uh, we do have direct antidote for MH and that is dental in sodium. So the first thing you do is you need to actually call for help. You will need a lot of help when uh, you have patients with MH. You will need one person who will only, uh, you know, will be looking at the preparing dentalin. It's not easy to prepare dentalin. You will let the, uh, the surgeon know that you suspect MH and uh, they might actually have to either abandon the surgery or they might have to, uh, you know, rapidly finish the surgery. Okay. You will discontinue the volatile agents Obviously, you would have given already given succinomethanium. We can't do anything about it. You will have to increase the oxygen to 100 percent, uh, increase the flows, uh, increase minute ventilation, uh, hyperventilate them to get rid of the excess carbon dioxide. You need to find out what the temperature is, so you would need monitoring of the temperature. Now, looking at the dentalin, dentalin. Each vial is 20 milligrams and it needs to be diluted with 60 ml of warm, sterile and preservative-free uh, water. You need to give 25, sorry, 2.5 milligram per kg of dentalin uh, with IV uh, push. And you keep repeating it, uh, you know, almost every 15 minutes uh, till the antidotal carbon dioxide uh, begins to decline. And you might need as much as 10 to 20 milligram per kg of dentalin in some cases. 
but if there's no dram dramatic uh, response uh, to uh, you know uh, treatment with dantrolene then you have to actually think of the alternative diagnosis in these cases now if the surgeon says that we have to continue the surgery uh, or we need to this is really urgent surgery in that case uh, you need to move on to uh, non-triggering anesthetic agent and greatest thing about uh, the MH is that there are only two things that trigger MH that is the uh, depolarizing muscle relaxant sexamethonium and the volatile anesthetic so you take away these two uh, you can actually give uh, anesthesia for MH uh, very safely so in this case you might actually have to use propofol infusion uh, combined with opioids uh, or midazolam you need to ensure that there you have adequate IV access. You might need to actually put in a central line. You will need arterial line. You will need a urinary catheter. Okay, and uh, if there is MH uh, hotlines, you need to speak to the consultants uh, uh, about the management. Okay, they will help you in uh, how to manage these cases. And these cases, uh, irrespective of uh, how they behave, they will actually need ICU admission uh, for further management. You will start uh, uh, trying to control the temperature because this temperature can go above 38 degrees very easily. Uh, and the uh, you know aim is to bring down the temperature below 38. So you can reduce the temperature, uh, ambient temperature in the operating room. And uh, if you're warming the patient, you can actually uh, switch over from uh, the uh, warm to ambient uh, air. You can use ice packs around the patient's uh, big vessels, so in the groin uh, and the under the axilla. Okay, you can also uh, use ice saline to lavage through NG tube. Uh, you can ask the surgeons to irrigate the surgical wound with cold ice uh, saline. Okay, you will actually have to send repeated samples for blood gases, for electrolytes, for coagulation studies. Uh, complete blood count uh, for uh, creatinine kinase, for myoglobin, for lactates. You will have to do urine analysis. You, it's easy to just take a you know dipstick and look for heme uh, in the uh, urine. And you can also measure the urine myoglobin levels. You will need to treat the complications uh, of you know, metabolic acidosis. And um, sometimes you might actually have to use sort of a bicarb even though uh, you know there is already increased co2 production but if the patients uh, require it and uh, they are not responding to your vasopressors or anotropes then you might actually even have to uh, try to normalize the ph using uh, soda bicarb hyperkalemia need to be treated okay you might actually again uh, this is a imbalance of calcium metabolism but then even then uh, calcium is the only uh, you know uh, the uh, physiological antagonist for potassium and uh, here the calcium increase is intracellular okay this is not in the blood you're not seeing uh, hyperkalemia in the blood it is happening uh, you know everything is going on within the muscle uh, so you can actually use uh, calcium chloride or calcium gluconate and uh, you would also uh, need to use glucose insulin uh, to uh, reduce the uh, potassium levels within the blood. And uh, if the patient develops uh, ventricular arrhythmias, you will actually have to uh, treat uh, the acidosis and hyperkalemia, which are the, the commonest cause for these happening. And you use usual uh, your ACLS protocols uh, to treat hyperkalemia. And uh, if the cardiac arrest uh, still occurs, then you just follow uh, your protocols for uh, the uh, CPR, you continue the CPR. Now, if you're working in the cardio uh, cardiac center, then cardiopulmonary bypass uh, is very useful because uh, you can not only, uh, you know, cool them uh, during uh, the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, but also you can actually also, uh, you know, uh, treat uh, hyperkalemia, uh, which uh, is easy to treat uh, uh, while they are on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, so this is this is the last resort if the patient actually go into uh, refractory cardiac arrest. And um, uh, for uh, the rhabdo myelitis, uh, we might actually have to use uh, you know diuretics like frisimide. 
Uh, luckily, the uh, dentrolin uh, contains uh, three grams of mannitol, uh, which will initiate uh, diuresis. And uh, dentrolin is uh, also very uh, alkaline, uh, but you might actually still need to use bicarb. Uh, make sure the uh, urine is alkalinized, and this prevents precipitation of myoglobin in the uh, kidneys. Uh, so uh, not only detect uh, heme in the urine, but also make sure that pH is always maintained on the higher side of the urine. Now, even after the you actually have aborted the uh, MH, uh, you still need to continue giving IV dentrolin, and uh, you need to give a dose of uh, one milligram per kg every six hours for 36 hours, or even longer if symptom persist. You will have to uh, do serial uh, lab tests for every six hours. You have to send for potassium, lactates, and other, uh, you know, uh, bloods. You need to be aggressive in treating uh, hypothermia, acidosis, hyperkalemia, and uh, uh, myoglobinuria. Uh, you need to monitor blood glucose every one to two hours because we would be using uh, dextrose insulin uh, for the uh, hyperkalemia. And you have to ensure that the urine output is maintained more than 2 ml per kg per hour. So this is not, we're not talking about 0 0.1, which we know. Here we're talking about like a forced diuresis, okay. And it is also important that it's not just the patient. We will need to also speak to the family members and uh, their counseling has to be done. And they would also need to be referred to the MS units. It's also important that the anesthetist or anesthesiologist is going to actually write a letter to the general practitioner or the family physician and a letter, uh, a copy should be given to the patient uh, after the recovery or discharge. The CK need to be uh, measured, like say it rises late, uh, 14 to 24 hours after the acute episode and it need to be measured at least twice daily in the intensive care for several days. And I've already explained about the uh, heme on dipstick and uh, this is uh, for uh, myoglobinuria. So when we actually, uh, you know, uh, are uh, treating patients, dentolin is the uh, uh, drug of choice and uh, most of our hospitals, rather every hospital will actually have it, MH cot. <clears throat> So uh, once and, uh, the uh, alert is raised, uh, the MH card is brought in and this contain uh, dentolin, uh, 20 milligram vials, there will be 36 of them. And there is two liters of water, there is soda bicarb, uh, there is drugs like frisamide, calcium chloride, lidnoke. Uh, insulin is usually kept in the fridge. There will be angiotubes tubes of various sizes and there will be tubes for collection of blood and uh, there'll be arterial and CVP kits, and uh, there are plastic bags in which you can place ice for cooling the patient. There are spikes uh, which are used for transferring dentalin into a bag. There'll be dipsticks which can uh, look for uh, heme, and there'll be various uh, temperature probes which can be uh, his facial, tympanic, rectal, blood, or skin temperature probes. So dentalin uh, being the drug of uh, choice, rather the antidote, uh, we need to know a little bit more on that. On the, you can actually see in the bag uh, the dentalin, how it looks after it's, uh, it uh, is reconstituted. Uh, like I've said, it comes in a powder form and you need 60 ml for every 20 milligrams. And it is a, a really, really difficult to actually dissolve uh, the powder form. And that's why I said you need one person who's assigned just to actually prepare uh, dentalin for, for you. So dentalin is not only used on MH, it was actually uh, first used orally uh, for uh, muscle spasticity, heat stroke, cerebral palsy, uh, in post-stroke patient, patient with paraplegia, patient with uh, multiple sclerosis. And there is actually also a thought that it might be useful in tetanus as well. And it's also acutely used for neuroleft malignant syndrome. Okay. So dentalin is a phenyl hydrant Adentoin uh, derivative and uh, in the oral form it is available as 25 to uh, 100 milligrams uh, but uh, for us for theaters it's uh, 
uh, available as 20 milligrams uh, uh, dentalis sodium. Uh, it also contains 3 grams of mannitol and uh, some sodium hydroxide. And uh, when constituted, it is a very alkaline solution. The pH is 9.5 uh, for dental. This is a prepared solution, uh, which is good. Uh, 3 grams of mannitol helps in diuresis, and the pH uh, makes it alkaline, so it's good for uh, uh, myoglobinuria as well. <clears throat> The dandelion also, uh, uh, you know, it uh, has got some anti-gaminergic uh, uh, action as well. And so it not only inhibits the release of uh, calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it can make you sleepy as well. So the dose for acute hypothermia, like I've said, was 2.5 mg per kg IV stat. And uh, you give this uh, through a large vein or to center line every 15 minutes and the maximum to 20 mg per kg. Uh, per day. Uh, for uh, prophylaxis uh, in an oral dose, it is given in the dose of 4 to 8 milligram per kg per day. Okay, and uh, when you talk about prophylaxis, is, is, uh, this is this is for not for the MH. Uh, oral dose uh, for spasticity is around 25 to 50 milligram six hourly. Okay. And uh, so if you look at a 70 kg man, uh, and uh, we'll, we have got 20 milligrams per ampule, uh, you might need as much as uh, 175 milligram uh, when you're looking at 2.5 milligram per kg. This is equivalent to 9 uh, ampules or vials, actually, not ampules, the vials. Okay, and uh, if you mix the 9 of them with 60 ml of water, you have 540 ml of solution to give. Uh, for each uh, of them and this need to be given uh, you know pretty rapidly it does not have any significant effects on cardiovascular or respiratory system uh, but it does have uh, cns effects like so it has got uh, gaminergic effects which can uh, cause sedation in awake patients and uh, this is when you use it orally uh, it is highly uh, you know irritant it's got a very high uh, ph of 9.5 and uh, in, in people who have used it, uh, you know, chronically, it can cause muscle weakness, uh, drowsiness, and GI disturbances. And it can also cause reversible hepatic dysfunction in 2% because it is metabolized in the, in the liver. So uh, it is uh, orally very well absorbed, almost 70%. And it is a highly protein bound. It's 80-90% protein bound and metabolized in the liver, like I said. So coming to the malignant hyperparexia uh, testing, uh, the common test which is actually mentioned is uh, CHCT or IVCT. IV is in vitro contracture test. Uh, CHCT stands for caffeine halothane contracture test. There is no non-invasive diagnostic testing. These are all invasive testing, okay. So uh, this involves uh, open uh, biopsy of skeletal muscle, okay. And uh, this is done not only for the patient, but also for the family uh, members because uh, it is an autosomal disease. Uh, so the parents might have it, the siblings might have it. Okay. So I call it a hack uh, test <laughs> because of the people uh, who describe them. And uh, so uh, the uh, contracture test to caffeine uh, was described by. Uh, uh, Callao in 1970, uh, whereas Ellis and colleagues uh, described this uh, to halothane in 1971. So halothane was uh, described by Ellis, that is HE, and uh, caffeine uh, susceptibility uh, was described by Callao, so CK. So I call it HEC test. Okay. This is just for uh, postgraduates to remember, for especially for MCQs. So for the, uh, you know, the muscle uh, contracture test, uh, you need a sample, muscle sample from the vastus lateralis or medialis, uh, weighing around 100 to 150 milligrams. Uh, it's separated out from the biopsied muscle and they're mounted uh, in a chamber containing buffer solution. And this need to be done within five hours of harvesting. So you can't actually keep, uh, keep the sample for very long time. So you can't take a sample and then send to MH unit. So patients actually go to the MH unit where uh, the uh, muscle biopsies are taken. 
So each uh, muscle sample is attached to a sensitive strain gauze and uh, then uh, it is uh, caused to uh, contract using electrical stimulation and then exposed to caffeine and halothane. Okay. Uh, so this uh, is a graph showing the uh, contracture to halothane exposure, 3% halothane exposure. And uh, then you measure the uh, force generated. And like you can actually see in the first one, there is a, a force generated of 1.2 grams. Now this is significant because normal response uh, to the supramaximal stimulus only generates a force around 0.5 grams. In the second one, it looks like it is around 1.6 grams, and the third one, it is 1.4 grams. So this is a, a positive test. Okay. Same thing again will be done with uh, contracture uh, to, uh, you know, caffeine exposure as well. The protocols varies uh, uh, between country to country. So this is different in Europe uh, than in Japan or in the North America. So they they have a, a different uh, uh, you know uh, yeah, exposures so for example the european protocol a muscle contracture of uh, uh, greater than 0 0.2 grams at a concentration of less than 2 millimeters caffeine and uh, less than 2% halothane is considered positive for mhs okay so uh, this is uh, different from different countries so you actually have to know that so as far as the, uh, you know, based on the uh, test results, uh, it is considered to be MHS, <coughs> wherein the muscle contracture uh, occurs to both uh, halothane or caffeine. It is considered to be equivocal if uh, the muscle contracts to just one of them. So either contracts to caffeine or to halothane, not both of them. And <clears throat> if there's no contracture uh, to either of the agent, then it is considered to be MH negative. <coughs> so the sensitivity of this test is around 97%, uh, but uh, specificity is actually lower. So 15% of patients uh, with uh, positive uh, CHCT have a false positive uh, test. And there have been attempts to increase the sensitivity and uh, this has been done by using ranolin uh, and uh, chlorocrisol uh, to the muscle contracture test. Okay. So obviously patients who have uh, suspicion of MH uh, are definitive indication. Uh, children who develop mesotric spasm uh, are another uh, group of patients who would need that. You can also <clears throat> do this test for unexplained rhabdomyolysis during or after surgery. You can uh, also do them for patients who present multi-moderate uh, muscle, uh, so mesotric spasm, and uh, who show signs of rhabdomyolysis. And also it can be done in patients who have exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. It's probably not indicated in urolet uh, malignant syndrome where dentrolin is used. It is not necessary in sudden unexpected cardiac arrest during anesthesia or patients who present with uh, rhabdomyolysis in the post-operative period. The contracture test is not done in uh, children who are less than five years of age or patients who have uh, weight is less than 40 pounds. Okay, so you uh, actually uh, have insufficient uh, muscle mass. Patients who are equivocal uh, can undergo uh, molecular uh, genetic analysis. And uh, so it's also recommended to family members of ProBand. And, but unfortunately, molecular testing is not available in all the countries. It is available in Europe, uh, but not in all the uh, uh, countries. Uh, we talked about the genetics of MH. Okay, we look at RYR1, that is RNA receptor mutations, uh, which is detected in almost 25 to 30 percent of uh, uh, susceptible individuals. Uh, the samples are taken just like for any DNA testing for either buccal mucosa. Uh, it, they can also use white cells, muscle cells. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, 
So what about anesthesia for patients who are susceptible to MH? That's very easy. We know they're just true trigger agents. They're succinamethonium and uh, uh, the volatile anesthetic. You just avoid them. So you just use uh, uh, total intravenous anesthesia or use just a primary regional technique. So either spinal or epidural or no blocks. Okay, You can use uh, you know, sedation with profol uh, or dexmetamidine uh, along with it. <clears throat> It's important to monitor the temperature and minute ventilation in these patients. Uh, prophylactic uh, dentrolin is not indicated uh, when uh, triggering agents are not administered. Okay, <clears throat> but if you are actually uh, are planning for a GA, okay, our GA is necessary. Then in that case, then you can actually start the dose one to two days earlier or. Uh, dentalin can be started on this patients. Uh, so the preventive measures which are need, need to be taken is that uh, we need to reduce the exposure to traces of volatile anesthetics. So uh, your machines need to be flushed either overnight or if you don't actually have a new machine then at least flush it at uh, 10 liters per minute for 20 minutes. Make sure the vaporizers are taken out. It's not a question of just switching them off. I think it's better to just take them out. And uh, you need to uh, cycle the ventilator at least uh, with five, minute, uh, five cycles uh, per minute uh, during these 20 minute flushing cycles. Okay. And uh, if you're using soda lime um, uh, for your uh, circle system, then you need to make sure that you use uh, fresh soda lime uh, for this. Okay. And in the post-operative period, you need to observe them for at least four hours. And even if you are doing it as a day case surgery, then make sure that the patients are instructed clearly and that if they have fever or they are passing, you know, brown or tea-colored urine, then they need to come back to the hospital for further observation and testing. Uh, counseling of the patients and family members is uh, important in these cases. Uh, so uh, they can undergo uh, muzzle testing or they can go undergo genetic testing. Uh, you need to inform the patient and uh, the future, uh, you, know, uh, you know, anesthesias can be uh, dangerous. So the anesthetist uh, need to know about that. Uh, you need to write a letter to the GP uh, they can actually have a alert bands uh, which says that it's susceptible to uh, MH. Uh, they should be cautioned against a heat stroke so they do not get exposed to, to hot and humid con uh, conditions. And you encourage the patient to learn more about their condition. You can actually, the MH units will provide them educational material resources. So this is uh, the, you know, just the... Uh, diagram actually showing uh, how you uh, go ahead with the testing and which so this is I have already explained that uh, who are susceptible who are negative and uh, who can undergo the genetic testing uh, counseling uh, of the family members especially first degree family members of the pro band uh, is important because they have 50 50 chances of uh, developing this this is an autosomal uh, dominant uh, disease uh, the uh, penetrance is variable. I've explained that there can be history that uh, the patients have had uh, anesthetic and not shown it, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that they cannot actually uh, trigger a match in the post-operative period because of the uh, variable penetrance. So the family members can't say, oh yes, my brother actually had it, but I can't have it because I've had three GAs in the past. No, that is not true. Okay. And again, uh, the, uh, I said de novo uh, gene mutations can occur in everyone. The parents of uh, proband should also be tested because it's quite possible that the parents have not been exposed to general anesthetics or the other triggering agents like succinamethonium. Uh, so it's important to test the uh, you know parents as well. Sibling, obviously, uh, they have a 50-50 chance of actually acquiring it. Uh, this is again uh, a diagram showing how the testing is done uh, in the relatives of the patients. Uh, this is just a genetic uh, actually flow diagram uh, in patients looking at that. So the one with the positive red 
is the uh, pro band and uh, the siblings are shown below and uh, so 34 years old is negative uh, 31 years old is positive 28 years old is negative so there is actually 50 50 chances in uh, patients having that uh, in this case the parents are uh, are not uh, alive but if their parents were alive then we would actually also test the patient the parents as well so that brings us to the end of the lecture and thank you everyone for listening to the lecture.